Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Lunch with a Scientist. I'm Leia with Headwater Science Institute. Today, we're going to be introduced to another scientist doing some great conservation and ecology work internationally. And before we get to that, I wanted to give you just a couple Headwaters updates. So we're very, very excited. This week, Thursday, we are going to be presenting Robert Swan, Polar Pioneer. This is a free live stream talk, 5.30 p.m. on Thursday. Or if you can't make it, you can watch the archives until 10 p.m. on the 6th. And Robert is the only man to have ever walked both poles, all in effort for um, his lifelong journey to try to stop climate change. So he's a very important figure. We're so excited to meet him and so excited to have him speaking to all of you. So you can register still for tickets at bit.ly slash polar pioneer. And we would love to see you there. The other exciting news is that we've released registration for our summer programs. Our regular summer research experience is available as well as our specially tailored girls summer research experience. That program also includes a week long option to camp up here at Weber Lake in the Tahoe area in a safe, socially distanced way. So either program is a great option for students to do research paired with a professional scientist mentor. It's an awesome thing to add to a college application and a really, really cool way to take what you're interested in and learn how to actually turn it into a research project where you then author a research paper that gets published. So you will exit that program with something really neat to show from your experience. So please feel free to check that out on our website. Now for today's talk, I am very excited to introduce you to Eben Broadbent. He runs the Spatial Ecology and Conservation or SPEC lab at the University of Florida, which he founded in 2014 along with his wife. He is an ecologist who works in conservation and also uses technology to do some surveying of the areas that he works in. So today he's specifically gonna talk to you about Gator Eye, a really cool uh, drone system that he uses to further his conservation efforts. So I am very pleased to welcome Eben Broadbent. Good morning, Eben, how are you today? I'm doing great. Thank you for inviting me to this uh, webcast. Thank you so much. We're really excited to hear you present. So I'm going to pull in your presentation and let you take it away. Thanks so much. Great. So it's my pleasure to talk about challenges and opportunities for ecological mapping using drones. And I'm going to be highlighting uh, some of our recent research in the last couple of years and introducing a new big plot network. I have way more slides than I'll probably be able to get into depth on. So some of them I'll just skim over. But you know, if that's the case, they're pretty pictures, so it'll be okay. I'm presenting along with my wife, uh, Dr. Almeida Zambrano, who's the co-director of our lab, co-director of the Gator Eye I'll be talking about, and also a faculty member here at the University of Florida. We met here 22 years ago, and we've been having adventures ever since, as I'll be highlighting in our presentation here. So there's a lot of challenges in the world, and remote sensing from satellites, aircraft, and drones is, going, is helpful in order to help understand where um, things are happening and how we might be able to support to reduce the uh, risks associated with them. And it can lead to actions such as sending um, um, foresters out into the field to understand what's happening in the Amazon or things like that. So basically there's so many different kinds of technology these days that it's really important that we use and implement all the different technology available in order to accomplish our objectives. So we've got people in the field working on things, they're flying drones, there's aircraft flying overhead, and there's whole suites of new satellites above, above us all at all times. Some of the new satellites are totally incredible in changing how we're able to see the planet. Planet microsatellites recently launched constellations, hundreds of tiny shoebox sized satellites, enabling us to now see the entire world, the terrestrial surface every single day at high resolution. So three meter resolution, totally unbelievable um, an advance that only happened in about the last year. So how did drones fit into this? It used to be like, well, they give you really high resolution pictures of, of the forest and of different places, but now satellites can do that. So how are drones still really useful for us? Well, they are, and, they, and their niche is constantly changing as I'm going to be pointing out. There's a lot of different kinds of drones. You could spend tens of millions of dollars on a military style global hawk that can fly for three days, or you could spend $200 on 
a, a drone that can fly for 20, 30 minutes. Well, if you spent $200 one year ago, it'd probably fly for five minutes. Technology is advancing so fast in this field, it's very exciting to keep track of. I bet many of you are flying drones that include some of these different sensors. The main ones being visual, just like your camera, multispectral, hyperspectral, like all types of light and thermal that you can't even see with your eyes, and some that shoot lasers, as I'll be describing, enabling you to understand the third dimension of our surroundings, the size and shape of trees, the height of forests, all types of exciting things. So I've been working with, with drones now for quite a long time, probably about eight years. Uh, back, back in the days, we were flying LIDAR, tiny laser. Uh, this would shoot 16 individual lasers, hundreds of thousands of times a second from this aircraft. Aircraft tend to crash a lot. I crash this thing a lot. And we've been uh, constantly advancing and moving in. And in fact, just uh, three days ago, I was back up at Moundville Archaeological Site with our new system do, conducting flights where we're looking to try to find a wall that extends around the mounds of this area. We have not yet been able to detect it. And it may be that subtle, uh, subtle elevational features that we can detect from our drone system might enable us to identify things that are a thousand years old. So our drone up, our data collection operations typically involve our family. This is my daughter, Liana, collecting data in the uh, Brazilian um, Cerrado, along with Angelica in the background flying fixed wings. Uh, we work a lot in the Americas. So we work in Costa Rica. We've uh, conducted training exercises on how to uh, measure parameters of the forest, like how open is the forest, and then using fancy GPS units, uh, simple drone systems in which we train graduate and undergraduate students how to collect and fly missions, just like this one covering tens of kilometers in just some minutes. And then using all of that, these high resolution images to generate three dimensional representations of the forest, which we can then use to understand questions about where are birds, where are bats, how are they interacting about conservation issues, or as simple as trying to sell my house in Alabama, which I recently sold about a year ago. And in fact, this 3D representation was not at all useful to it, but it's pretty cool that I could collect this data and then process it in only about 10 minutes of flying time using a process called photogrammetry. So pretty amazing flying through the forest just from a standard GoPro camera. So other places where we work, for example, in Costa Rica, Osar Verde, a lot of reforestation. I'll be down there next week um, collecting a lot of data from reef to ridge up into the mountaintops. You can, we can collect huge areas, a thousand, thousands of acres, and we can then zoom in and actually see little tiny things like individual rocks, um, dry, the marks from trucks driving through there, um, the mowing patterns in the grass, or we can go back and use that 3D uh, representation and data to understand how do jaguars interact with this environment. They're probably following the rivers, the riparian areas where there's more areas to hide. Out in the open areas, you're gonna find more butterflies, all different kinds of studies that we're doing down there. So it's really great to have this 3D structure because that's how animals interact with their ecosystems. And so we're constantly doing it uh, with camera traps and we're integrating uh, other aspects here such as virtual reality into our classes, working with graduate students. It's very exciting. I wish that I could get you all uh, sitting down flying drones with virtual reality goggles. I think it would be a lot of fun. So you can have very cheap systems. You can fly over in a couple minutes to get beautiful uh, visual uh, photographs st stitched together, which is technically called an ortho mosaic. It's just very pretty. It's, it has three dimensional aspects, uh, all from standard visual cameras. So then you start putting all of this into this big system with satellites, with aircraft, with people on the ground to start being able to ask questions that you're interested in. So dr you can do a lot with drones, but what can you do with an airplane? So some of the very most amazing airplanes out there right now, for example, are ones flying many different kinds of sensors at once. One is the NEON Airborne Observatory Platform. This flies is the biggest federal grant funded project. It's a billion dollar project over 30 years flying all different types of sensors. And so when I was doing my PhD um, in Hawaii, where I lived for four years climbing trees, uh, we used a, a very similar one on which the AOP was modeled called the Carnegie Airborne Observatory. So this system uses both LIDAR and hyperspectral to do all this stuff that basically in the end looks like a forest if you were out walking around in it. We spent years climbing trees, setting up climbing ropes, Tyrolean traverses, these are called, we'd repel off them with expensive equipment to look at plant leaf physiology. And then with that, we could start to understand how the forest is. So then I finished my PhD, started to get a faculty positions. And I said, I don't have one of these fancy airplanes. They're $8 million, what do I do? You could use a system like this 
And actually, this is one of the first unmanned aerial vehicles. But really, the data it provides is inadequate. And so I came up with a, with a drone-based idea to try to collect similar sensor data to create a virtual forest on a, on a budget that I could afford coming up with the GatorEye. And you can go to this website and check it out, GatorEye.org. That's kind of what it looks like. This is an example of a pretty, a, a pretty example of shooting lasers into the forest to get its structure. So the GatorEye UFL Unmanned Flying Laboratory, here we are collecting data in mountains of northern Peru, uh, along with my son, Kai. And so basically, we have different flight platforms, the thing that flies stuff around. And underneath, we have sensors, which are the real core of the GatorEye system. I really prefer the hexacopter or the copter system because you can go to remote forest gaps in the middle of the rainforest, fly, weed your way up through the forest canopy gap, and then send the drone out to collect data a kilometer away or more. It's just all kinds of stuff that it measures. It's measuring structure using LIDAR, all types of things about plant, water concentration and health using hyperspectral data, thermal dynamics, how hot is it, all types of things. This is what it looks like if you zoom in. And there's tons of specs that I'm not gonna be getting into, but really what you care about is that it can, it can create models of trees that you can fly into and you can experience it in many ways as if it was a virtual forest so that you can ask any question that you're interested in asking. Here we are collecting data in the middle of one of the most remote parts of the Amazon, the Chico Mendez Reserve in Acre, with a lot of collaborators. Uh, Kai in this picture was just a couple months old, took a full day of driving in trucks on these roads to get out there. And we created all these virtual forests and then started quantifying biomass and doing all sorts of neat things about ecology. And you can look in and see leaves of palm trees and all types of things about here. So is this, is this system like, uh, yeah, you can take it there, you can collect all this data. Does it collect good data? Well, the amazing thing about LIDAR is even every second, it's shooting up to 600,000 points per second. And every one is if you had a trained um, surveyor with a laser system. And every one of these points, we know where it is within just centimeters. So we've done all different kinds of tests to check this out, but we're getting incredibly accurate vir uh, virtual forests. So that's the structural part. Hyperspectral is a whole different thing. Basically, if you look at your camera, you're getting about three bands of data. With hyperspectral, we're now getting hundreds and hundreds of bands of data, most of which is outside what our eyes can see. So we're able to look at things like detailed chemical concentrations and structure of leaves, things that is invisible to our eye, but becomes obvious when you use the right technology. So you get all these kinds of curves, all this information with the goal being to understand where are the different species, how healthy are they, uh, what is the different soils and things like that going on. All this information, you wanna get into that, you can go for it, you can become an ecophysiologist or, or a remote sensing expert if you want. It's all about electromagnetic radiation. It's all about the sun shooting out energy from giant plasma flames flying something like nine minutes at the speed of light to get here and then re reflecting off vegetation um, and, and providing us information about that. The same, the same type of electromagnetic radiation that is used for um, FM radios, AM radios, for x-rays, everything is all about the sun. So you should learn a lot more about the sun. You should think about rainbows and all of that because it's all about information that can, we can use. So this is an example of what it looks like in thermal. This is also, you know, we can feel thermal radiation from the sun using our skin. We can't see it with our eyes. However, a fancy camera here called a radiometric thermal camera can actually take a picture that is what your skin is feeling, but now we're having thermal. So you can see me over here standing by the truck in bright white, I'm very hot. And then we see that actually the leaves of the forest much cooler and different things. So what does this look like? Well, this is what it looks like visually and that's what it looks like in the thermal world. So there's so many opportunities with wildlife once you start thinking about thermal data. So very cool. So of course, what do you wanna do with all this? You wanna put it all together. You wanna to use it all at once, just like our bodies do. We walk into a forest and you're like, hey, that's a big tall tree. It's got a lot of leaves. You're doing structural assessment. That's what the lighter sensor does. You look at it and you're like, oh, the leaves are getting kind of yellow. It's not so healthy. Now that's hyperspectral sensor. And your body's like, wow, I'm really hot. I'm sweating because the sun is coming in between the leaves and hitting your body. And now you're using, that's a thermal measurement. So your body is like a super data fusion um, system. And this is a data fusion system. It just uses technology hardware to do what our bodies are doing naturally all the time. You wanna fuse them together so that you can start asking questions about the health of vegetation, species composition, everything you might care about. That's where we want to be, data fusion. That, that's our goal, and we try to do it in as many parts of the world as we can, get projects to do in collaborations. So how do you analyze all this data? The process is called 
image segmentation. So it's the exact same thing that you do with your head, with your eyes all day long. It's an incredibly amazing and complicated processing algorithm that we just do and take for granted. Look at the screen, you're like, oh, it's a rectangle. You just segmented the screen and all its myriad colors and shapes from the background of all the other colors and shapes back there. And you did it instantly and you do it right now and you're continuing to do it. And it takes you very little processing power because our brains and our heads are running on 100 watts, the equivalent of a 100 watt light bulb we're powering here. And it, with super, the most fast supercomputer that we can even create that takes up like a building, we're not even coming close to a very large fraction of what we're able to do here. Totally mind, mind boggling the, the computing power and the power efficiency that we have going on and we use image segmentation to do that. So you don't want to think about, you don't want speckles of information. You want to divide it. You want to say, oh, this is a building. Yeah, it's got shadows and reflected areas, but that whole thing's buildings and you see the buildings and the trees and stuff. And so you get patterns. And so we can do that. We can fly over areas and collect data of all these trees. And then we can go through and automatically identify where the trees, just like you can do. You're like, oh, those are trees, those little, those little points and stuff. Yeah, put that into the algorithm world. It gets really complicated takes a lot of time, never works as good as what you can do with your eyes. But then you can go ahead and get that done. You can segment your trees, meaning identify separate trees, get all this information about them. And you're doing what would otherwise take many hundreds or thousands or an impossible amount of time to do in the field quickly and automatically. So that's really great. So how does this new drone system compare to aircraft? Oh, well, it's about versus 8 million. So it's true. It's got a lot of the same sensors. It's a lot cheaper to fly. It's a much smaller team and it's, it's uh, field portable. So, you know, we've been, this is, we've been publishing papers on comparing drones and aircraft here. You can see examples here. Um, you know, we've been comparing different types of specs and resolutions and data point densities, and it's great. We've been flying around collecting data and a lot of our work is right here in Florida where we're based. So there's lots of great stuff to measure in Florida and pine plantations including, for example, islands off of Cedar Key right here in the Gulf of Mexico. We went out there working with archaeologists from the University of Florida, flying our system over these islands. And then here is what it looks like from high res data. But once we use our lasers shooting through the forest canopy, we can peel all those trees away and we uh, and uncover 900 year old ruins covering the, the large part of this island and all types of insights related to that. Got a paper in a good journal called PNAS peeling away those forests, digging into the soils, and then we're up here in the Guardian and got a huge amount of publicity recently about that. So that was exciting, uh, uncovering Gulf Coast archaeology using drones and lasers. How awesome is that? So it's actually true. That's technically that is true. It's just kind of the sens sensationalist wording of it all. So we work a lot with the Forest Service here, all types of hardware development and things like that. So we've had lots of different adventures in the course of our drone work so far, and we've got a lot more coming up. Here we are up in the, in the Andes doing trainings on how you can use this technology. We fly our drone up into the tops of these Andean mountains here in the, in the clouds of the cloud forest. And then sometimes if you misunderstand where the ground is, you can crash into it, which happened here and it was a bummer. Fortunately, we have tracking mechanisms that we uh, figured out were based on how they track hunting falcons and I stuck one on our drone. So we beep this thing around and about six, eight hours later, we were able to actually find it. Actually, our assistant found it in the top of a tree right there. This is about 95 feet up. So we had to go to the local town. We found a guy who said, sure, I'll go get it for you. And he did. He just got in his socks, climbed up the tree, and brought it down intact. <laughs> and we were able to continue on with, with adventures in Peru and then in Costa Rica immediately afterwards. The kind of data you can get from this is pretty incredible. This one's particularly dense because the drone crashed into about that tree you're seeing right there and sat there for a while. We brought it to the local um, drone ER, actually my, um, my sister-in-law's vet, and we got it all fixed up. And then we went to Tumbes in Northern Peru where we did work with some of the top ornithologists in the world at the time. So we can see here looking at some crazy roads driving up here and crazy monsters here in the Northern Tumbes Peru region, big trees, it's a dry forest. So we fly over here and collect a lot of this structural data with the goal being to try to understand how changes in the structure of the forest like this, as you see with elevation, uh, impact changes in bird composition and density. So some of, some of the things are more, re, um, are more local. For example, we're interested in looking at uh, large scale impacts of hurricanes. So you can use satellite data to start getting a better understanding. And then once you know where the hurricanes are really impacting you, what types of forests, you can zoom in 
to these areas and you can figure out where do you want to go with drones. So it's this multi-scalar, multi-resolution approach. You zoom in and now you're getting like, it's almost like a, um, like a microscope going in and getting this kind of data. So totally different than the stuff you're getting from satellites over large scales. You're able to see it in 3D, big areas in short periods of time, individual trees looking at uh, trunks, and then you can look at individual damage scars where like a, a downburst from the hurricane would have come through and knocked a lot of trees down. We can actually quantify the number of trees and do a lot of, a lot of work based on that. So here's just some pretty pictures kind of zooming through. I'm not gonna get into there thinking about aircraft and drones and the value of one or the other segmenting out individual trees. And so one, one of our goals is to now use this new technology of drones uh, with these very detailed virtual forests to go beyond the traditional plot idea, which involves extensive field work, and to start implementing big plots, which is ultra high resolution multi-sensor data over large areas and put them all over the place. And this is the process. You set up the drone, you fly it, you have your mission planning, and you um, come up with you know these very dense LIDAR data sets of the area. And then, and then you know, then with this data, you can go back if you want in time. You can uh, do multi-temporal assessments. We can see our trees growing. Uh, are they? Is there a lot of disturbance? A lot of damage happening through time? You can ask all kinds of questions because the data is just so dense. And so the big plot network is being implemented now uh, all over the place. You can see zooming out to 500 by 500 um, meters here. One uh, one that we have here in Ordway Swisher, and we've got these now across the Americas and the U.S to be going back to these and working on it. Um, in the end, you know, you got to be combining the data you collect with field data. Um, part of that I'm interested in is, as you've seen in the presentation, wildlife. So we do things with bioacoustics. Something you should check out that's really great is the whole sound component. I already highlighted our eyes and our skin. Um, and now we've got also our ears, so much information in there. And so you can also use remote sensing technology, just part of this multi-scalar approach to be collecting automatically bird um, sounds and then identifying them automatically. We can, our new algorithms we're developing can even enable three-dimensional motion tracking. Then you put that in the context of these virtual forests and you can learn so much interesting information. So that's, so there's a lot of opportunities. There's a lot of amazing algorithm developments and adventures to be had there if you're interested in any of this kind of stuff. Thinking about fires, terrestrial things, so many types of sensors, um, lots of opportunities for collaborations and whatever you're interested in. So a lot of opportunities. Uh, it is challenging here. We crashed a drone, a different one, and th that airplane actually into a, into a tree in Costa Rica and had to go and track it down. And we found a different tree climber. He went up there and we brought it to a local electrician who worked on it for like an hour or two and it never worked again. So that was the end of that uh, drone. So, but you know, you gotta be careful where you land, you watch out for the cows and it's an exhausting effort on all these algorithm development. I do that stuff with my kids because it's a fun hobby, but you know, they're inspired. They love flying drones and we go out there and play with them all the time and think about and have a lot of adventures. So with our puppies, uh, we that's another plane that we also crashed into a tree. So yeah, you're gonna crash them. That's okay, that's part of it. So I'd like to thank all these collaborators. I'd like to thank you for uh, this 30 minutes of zooming over lots of pretty pictures. And I hope that, um, that you learned something and got inspired to wanna do this kind of stuff coming up. That's great. Evan, thank you so much for sharing all of your work. There's quite a lot of it. You're very welcome, my pleasure. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to go through all of that. Yeah, absolutely. So I do have a couple follow-up questions. Absolutely. Um, I'm wondering, people at home are maybe thinking about a recreational drone experience that they've had, these cheaper drones you can really just buy from the store now. What is flying your drones like versus something like that? Are you seeing things in real time and steering, or is there, like you said, kind of a flight plan? How does it work? Yeah, so um, most of our recreational drones are based on uh, having fun. And so the, the fun part is that you can see things from a new vantage point, and you can do it in, in real time, live. And you can take pictures and videos, because we all love doing that, and you want it right now. So that's, that's what it's about. It's about flying around and seeing a new perspective, pretending you're a bird, seeing the top of a tree or a house or whatever, uh, trying to do like some nice pictures of sunsets and you know kite borders and stuff like that. So that's um, in, in that, in terms of that interactive experience, they would find flying the Gator Eye, for example, very boring. That's not a entertainment device. It's actually rather stressful to be flying such an expensive piece of science equipment. And all of the enjoyment comes afterwards. 
I mean, I, I enjoy flying it. It's fun. You set it up. I love going to these places. I love the data collection. It's all, you know, you put in flight plans and you click it and it's flying it. You're monitoring system specs, but it's really uh, serious science work, data collection, a lot of responsibility and a lot of potential risks. And then following that, you download the data and we're collecting four gigabytes of data per second, no, per minute. So this is huge data volumes. And then in post-processing, that gets doubled. So, you know, we're talking like hundreds and terabytes of data having been collected and we have to deal with backup systems and how do we access certain things and, you know, 100, 100 pages of post-processing algorithms and many different programming languages. It's, it's, it's um, you know, science, it's engineering and remote sensing science and ecology. My entire background academically is actually uh, tropical botany for my undergrad, uh, tropical forestry for my master's, and then ecology and evolution for my PhD. Um, but throughout all of that, I started using the methods of remote sensing more and more. And this is just what I've found to be the most exciting cutting edge way to address questions on all those topics, conservation biology and everything. So it's a fantastic and exciting method. It does turn out that a lot of people's uh, careers are focused on the engineering aspects themselves or on software development. Um, so, but sometimes people are an ecologist looking for new methods and I'm kind of in the middle there because um, I'm also very excited about hardware development and cabling and, you know, voltages and all that kind of stuff. So I work with, uh, you know, some of the leading sensor and air, um, aircraft or drone flight companies. And, you know, we're coming up with new ideas and doing new things. They work with me because um, coming out of this is often opportunities to develop new products that have commercial applications and they can make some money out of it. So, you know, they're commercial, but my interests are, you know, pushing scientific limits for academic research purposes. I think it's fascinating that you've woven together so many disciplines. Really interesting. And so I'm wondering for students watching who maybe want to do some kind of ecology or conservation work, but want to do it from the technology side where they're improving the gear or programming new machines. Mm -hmm. What kind of educational path would you recommend for a student like that? Uh, well, I mean, there's, there's lots of people heading that I collaborate with working on these types of things that come more from like an engineering background. Um, so that, that would be a very interesting place to go. You, it could be more aircraft, aerospace engineering even. That's a lot of drone stuff. Sensor technology and engineering is a whole nother field, optics. And you know, um, th there's, there's, that's all stuff that undergrads are working on. Lots of career opportunities. It's, it's a very fast growing segment of, of the um, you know, US commercial industry is drone-based monitoring. And it's only becoming more and more so as the ease of use and their integration into the national airspace is increasing. So lots of opportunities there um, across the board. Now, if you're more, if you're more less interested in all of the technical software and hardware engineering component, then you can come at it from an ecologist and you can talk to them. And basically the stuff that right now is very challenging and innovative and new in five years is going to be something that's been um, condensed into something that's much more user-friendly and applied that you may be able to do yourself. For example, you can go now and buy a drone for $500 that didn't even exist five years ago. And if it did, it would have been massively expensive and maybe top secret or something. So the technology is advancing so fast. Uh, I think that probably most, most um, disciplines that I can think of that are engaged in outdoor research questions probably have uh, part of that question that could really gain some value from remote sensing, whether it's in the field, bioacoustics, uh, drone-based satellites, aircraft, et cetera. So. Yeah, it's fascinating. There's many different ways to come at the problem and all kinds of solutions that are rapidly developing. Like you said, in five years, it'll be totally different than it was today. Yeah, that's, that's part of what's so exciting about it and at times stressful is just the unbelievable pace of technological development that's going on here. It's mm -hmm. an on um, this exponential trend. It's incredible. I mean, 48 megapixel visual cameras on a small, non-expensive drone is now normal. <laughs> it's like, mm -hmm. wow. 48 megapixels, you go, you go back five years, you try to buy like the biggest, fanciest Sony DSLR camera and you're gonna be lucky if you can find eight. <laughs> you right. know, maybe 12. So I have just a couple more questions for you. Um, one of them is, so I know that you're based in Florida and you do some work locally, but you do a lot of work internationally. How do you manage international projects while working in a place that is not there? Do you have systems in Florida that mimic your international work or do you do planning and then you travel? 
How does all that work? Um, I, well, I work, I, I always work with uh, close collaborators everywhere I'm going. So I've got lots of collaborators around and um, also a lot of collaborators here at UF and in other places who together we have collaborators in other places as well. And some places, you know, I go and collect data myself, but not on big projects to really complex areas. Because if you want to get out into the middle of the Brazilian Amazon or something, you're not just going to show up and, you know, get a taxi and just go for it. You know, you you need to uh, you need to be working with good institutions. So if you wanted to work in the middle of the Peruvian Amazon, then you'd get in touch with Amazon Conservation. They've got, you know, biological stations there. Biological stations is a great way that anyone of you can actually start to experience these areas. And you should absolutely check them out. If you want to start with a nice one that, you know, your parents would probably be pretty okay with you going to, look into like La Selva. Uh, that's in Costa Rica. That's really widely known. Everyone loves Costa Rica. Um, it's a great starter place. You should go do a study abroad program at La Selva in Costa Rica. And then from there, there is thousands of biological stations. There's websites to do nothing but compile the locations and contact information for biological stations. So that you, a lot of people start this kind of international work through Peace Corps, um, actually starting to, you know, it's a good opportunity to start traveling, engaged in uh, work of social and environmental benefit. And then you start to get this experience in countries and contacts and you work from there. So there's a lot of different ways, but you know, it's, it's uh, I'm, I, with my family, we fly around and collect a lot of different data. The Gator Eye is like a, a unique system. So that goes where we go and it's airplane portable. So we take it with us. We don't have multiple ones of those sitting around just because they're too expensive. And insurance alone is close to $18,000 per year. So I couldn't imagine affording more than that once per year as it is. <laughs> wow. So we're always looking for donations from people. So Sure. Fascinating. Well, there you have it from a scientist himself recommending that you do some international travel and some scientific research. I think that's great. Um, just one fun question, Evan, to close things up. What is your favorite part of your work? My favorite part of my work? Um, I guess I just love being able to travel to um, places that I either have worked in for a long time and really love and cherish or experiencing new places and having some freedom of, of, of uh, planning it and being in kind of charge of what I'm doing. And in particular, having adventures with my family. Uh, so we've done so much data collection because, you know, my wife is an anthropologist. And so we work on research questions related to sustainability, coupling human with my more ecological background. For example, right now, I, I'm just so excited about this project we have in the Caribbean where we're going to be working this summer and the next two years in eight countries in the Caribbean doing linking drone data with social surveys and riparian restoration, water quality, and also reef quality. So we're just going to be spending a lot of time down there. How could I not be enthusiastic about that? So, you know, it's just lots of fun adventures. Uh, and, and all of it is, came out of my desire to want to, you know, help the, um, help the planet. Um, that's really a base inspiration. And you should check out, if you want to go way back in time, you could check out a movie like The Emerald Forest and stuff like that that was kind of inspirational back in the day for me. So. Great. Well, thank you so much for sharing with us and our students today, Evan. It was a pleasure to have you. Sure. If you've got um, you know, questions, you want to shoot me an email, you can get it from Leah. It's eben at ufl.edu. Just shoot me an email. I'll do my best to get back to you. Questions about grad school or something like that. Great. Thanks.